Uh, well, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak today here. It's not my first time in this uh, hall. Um, I have been the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the VU and have been uh, presenting for the Graduate School of Students in Social Sciences. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to be back. And I live uh, one street away from here, so the uh, UVA is always uh, the place where I go for short uh, walks. And I love the atmosphere here and uh, really happy to be here uh, today. Today I want to share some facts uh, about the SAP. Uh, give an introduction to what we are doing. Well, you already started doing that a bit. Um, I will uh, draw an image of um, what we see uh, occurring in current society, going into the topic of trust, going into the topic of structural disparities, uh, societal unease, and trust in politics. Um, after that, um, I will ask the question, uh, because that's oftentimes stated in newspapers, are we living in a polarized uh, society or not? And I will uh, end with some steps forward, because my story will be partly positive, but I will also have some sad news about the situation right now in the Netherlands. The um, SCP is one of three um, plan bureaus or institutes that advise the government uh, from independent research. The first that was founded was the CPB, focusing on uh, economic outcomes in society, and that was started after the war, because it was felt it was very important to, uh, to uh, keep hold of the progression in an economic sense. Uh, we were founded in 1973. Last year, March, our birthday started, and it will end the uh, end of next March, uh, because it was felt that also social and societal outcomes are important to keep track of. And finally, PBL was founded to also look at environmental outcomes, and I think no one will doubt these days that it's important to also keep track of how we are doing uh, inf inf environmentally. Okay, and what are we doing? We always say that we mirror how society is doing in terms of well-being of people, but also how society is functioning culturally. We uh, focus on um, social cohesion. We focus on uh, uh, inequalities, uh, disparities. We focus on quality of life of individuals. We look into trust or the relationship between uh, citizens and uh, politics. Uh, and we also focus on issues of participation. And we all regard those aspects as part of what we call broad prosperity. And increasingly, we collaborate with the other uh, plan bureaus in order to combine um, outcomes that are uh, environmentally, uh, outcomes that are economically, and outcomes that are more um, so, uh, on a societal well-being level. Uh, to uh, also advise policymakers about when you take this step policy-wise, what are the outcomes on the different dimensions uh, in an ecological, economic and social, societal or societal uh, sense. And we also are increasingly putting effort in developing the methodology of doing that in a rigid way, uh, combining both uh, qualitative and quant quantitative uh, methods. And it was already said in the introduction, there are meetings of the cabinet, and before those meetings, there are pre-meetings, and we are also at the table at those pre-meetings in order to advise on um, plans that are developed by the government. Usually, if the situation is at that point, we are too late. So we try to be much earlier in influencing and advising policymakers about um, what is the best thing to do. Uh, we are not paid to do things they ask us. We have an independent uh, money stream, and that also ma uh, makes us independent in the sense that we can decide on our own agenda. So our research agenda is developed in close collaboration with all the researchers in the institute, uh, and uh, 
of course, we need to be relevant to society. So if you're no longer relevant and just do things that we like uh, and are not of relevance to society, at some point our existence will stop. But in principle, we can choose what we deem important uh, to society, also strengthening our position at the table uh, with the cabinet. Then the image of society. How is the situation right now in Dutch society when you look at social and cultural aspects? First, which is very positive and people tend to forget, uh, the Netherlands has a high level of social trust. Um, people tend to think that other people are to be trusted in our society. And the level of social trust is not really changing. So it has been high, also relatively high compared to other European countries. Scandinavia stands out as well. But there's no, when you read in the paper that our, uh, the, the society is polarized and that people are not helping each other anymore, or trusting each other, that is not showing from our figures. So in that sense, positive news. Then, um, we uh, do worry about disparities. Uh, what we see is that differences between people in how well they can, can uh, live their lives are increasing. And when we look at disparities, we not only look at income and money people have on the bank, we also look at like social uh, capital. So what about the network a person has? Does a person have people to support him or her? We look at cultural capital. So uh, is, uh, where do, do people fit in? Are you able to, to be part of certain uh, circles that give you access to things in life? Lifestyle, but also digi digital skills and for example, command of English. Personal capital, which relates more to uh, who you are in terms of your health, your mental health, and also your self-confidence. We see that one out of six people in the Netherlands finds himself in a vulnerable position in that sense. And we see that the differences between people on, we see that these different forms of capital cluster in people, and that the differences between these groups of people become bigger and also the number of people uh, that are in vulnerable positions are, is also increasing. So not so good news about um, equality. And I know that the UvA is also involved in, a, in an institute here in Amsterdam that focuses on equality, so I think that work is, is really important also in these days. Mm. Then societal unease. Uh, societal unease of maatschappelijk onbehagen in Dutch uh, refers to pessimism about the direction a society is heading and a perceived decline and a collective powerless to stop that decline. So we think things are going heading in the wrong direc direction uh, and we feel not powerful to, to change that. And uh, you see that um, at this point, when we ask people how satisfied are you with your life, most people uh, answer positively, but their response to how satisfied are you with society is less positive, and more than half of the people think that the Netherlands is heading in the wrong direction. And societal unease is, um, is a phenomenon that is of all times, and it's also not bad that there is some uh, societal unease because it keeps people active and also standing up against the government. But the last couple of years, it uh, is, is, is more negative or the level is lower than uh, in earlier uh, phases. Then there is societal unease. So that's the answer to the question, do you think society is moving in the right direction? And political trust is more about how much trust do you have uh, in the government, and both in politicians and in the government uh, in broader sense. And what we see is that right now, uh, trust in politics is quite low. And if you look at the graph, and these are the, the different areas are divided according to the measurement method. But what you see is generally um, trust, political trust goes up and down, particularly uh, surrounding elections, it's usually a bit lower and then it goes up again. Uh, but right now we see a quite steady pattern of uh, political trust being low. What you see uh, in the questionnaires we are running 
and uh, there are a couple of colleagues uh, here in the front who actually do the research, so I'm only talking about it. <laughs> and what you see is that people think that politicians and the government right now are not really capable of solving uh, the problems we have in society. And they're pointing at topics that we can all imagine, like uh, solving the shortage of houses. Uh, they point at affairs that we had in Groningen uh, with uh, gas, but also at the, uh, the uh, affair with kindertoeslagen. I'm not sure about the English word, so uh, money that people could, give, could get from the, the uh, government for uh, their children. And we all know and we have all read in the papers that it's not going well and it is not uh, moving towards uh, a solution. And the people who are suffering from that are really suffering from a long and long time. That's not the only thing that people think. They also think that politicians are mainly concerned with, their, with themselves and that the political interaction or the political games are more important than uh, solving those issues. And the third aspect is that uh, people do not uh, think that politicians do not pay enough attention to what really concerns them. As note that politicians have no sense of what actually their problems are. And uh, well, 43% of the people think so. And more uh, around 50, like 52% of the people have low trust in um, politicians. Uh, and also in, uh, in, in the government, or I should say the cabinet and the uh, and parliament. So the, 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 the trust in the government is, is really low at this point. There's a, as a recent study has been published in which we also found some support for anti-government actions. We see that 6% of the people uh, state that the government deserves firm treatment and that even violence is allowed as the shape of those firm treatment or firm actions. And we also see, and that's the, the final one, 18% of the people think that the government functions so poorly that it's best to overthrow the whole system. And 18% is, well, it's not a majority, it's almost 20%, but it's almost one in five people, which is quite a considerable amount of people. So, uh, and with, when it comes to uh, violence, uh, we are always very careful to be too alarmistic in what we say. So this time we have been a bit alarmistic, uh, but of course it's very clear, and I think there's very nice research also by Jacqueline van Stekelenburg, works at the VU, that shows that between really using violence or having actions that are really rough, um, between thinking about it and actually doing it, there's of course a long road. But I think these figures show that people really feel hopeless and, and, uh, and want something to change. And I think the, the, the election outcome uh, also can be a clear reflection of that feeling. When you look at uh, societal unease and when you look at political trust, um, the figures are not the same across society. So there are clear group differences and th those uh, group differences may also be problematic. What we see on this slide is that there's not a big difference between males and females, but there is, for example, a clear a difference in the kind of uh, education people have. So people who have university education are much higher in trust than people who have only primary education of pre-vocational uh, school. Uh, you also see that um, trust is uh, higher in uh, younger people and goes down uh, with age. Then we also see that um, uh, inequality or disparities also show in different uh, answers to questions about trust and about how society is evolving. So what you see in this slide is that we, had a, uh, we did a research, and I don't want to go into it too deeply, but in which we distinguish between different class groups in society. But I think most interesting is that the upper class is the people who have most capital, 
most sources of capital clustering together. And so they are in a really advantaged position. And uh, the lowest two groups are the 16% I was talking about that are really vulnerable. And if you compare the lowest group, so what we call the precariat, and the highest group in their answers to questions about is the government helping me or has the government an eye for people like me, you see that the highest class and the lowest class really differ in the response. So there's 45% difference between the answer with the lowest class being much more negative. And also the question, the Netherlands is clearly moving in the wrong direction. Uh, the answer to that is also uh, related to the level people uh, have in society. And also the intention, and these are uh, data that were collected uh, before Corona, so that has been a while, but these data also show that more people tend not to vote uh, who belong to the lowest class. Then we can also see that uh, trust in politics is linked to parties uh, people vote for. And it's very clear from this picture that particularly when the study was performed, um, well, also right now, but it's a cabinet uh, that is uh, not really... Uh, it's de missionaire in Dutch. The parties that are in the cabinet are also uh, the people that vote for those uh, parties are the highest in trust. And you can, of course, also predict that more uh, populist parties are the lowest in trust because that's also an important part of their uh, political program. And so these slides show that there's a clear divide in society among people with high trust and people with low trust. And the group divides also go along uh, with identities people uh, have. Then uh, the topic of polarization, uh, which was the last topic I promised to speak about. And uh, what you see is that in the newspapers and wherever I'm giving a talk, and that's mostly for people who are working for the government uh, or in uh, companies um, and not an academic audience, so I think you will be more refined in your op opinion or in your impression, uh, but I don't know. But everyone thinks that society is highly polarized. And even if you show different figures, that idea stays in their heads. And also in the questions after a talk, usually people attack the fact that uh, my message or our message as SAP is, well, uh, be careful with being too alarmistic about this fact. Uh, but if we ask people, they have that impression. And uh, so what we find is that people feel that the Netherlands is becoming increasingly polarized. 73% uh, of Dutch people think that differences of opinion on social issues are increasing. Who uh, in the room thinks that is the case? A couple? Yeah. 61% uh, 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 see uh, large conflicts with, uh, between people with different political views. Who thinks that's the... Slightly more, okay. And uh, if we ask in uh, focus groups we have with people, uh, or, or also sometimes we ask people to write things down in questionnaires, what you see is that people refer to a deterioration in manners, a hardening of tone, and concerns about extreme expressions. Yes. You also see that 43% of the people think that the media increase divergencies and conflicts between people. And 76% think that internet and social media increase divergencies and conflicts between people. So people see polarization, they think they see polarization, and they point at uh, media also as an important factor promoting uh, polarization. Then the question is, is that really true? And are we heading towards a polarized society? Well, there's no clear divergence of political attitudes away from the center. Differences between people in, uh, in actual opinions is not really increasing. And I think at the UvA there's also interesting research uh, showing that. There's a slight increase in effective polarization, so not liking people from other groups that have different opinions, positions in life. 
But we can say that also in the 70s that was quite strongly the case. So it's not really uh, much worse than it it's, was by then. Uh, we see also that we do see that structural inequalities can increase feelings uh, of being left behind and damage people's view on society and politics. And we also see that relative socioeconomic de deprivation can fuel negative outgroup thinking and foster antipathy towards political opponents. So there are processes that are at the negative side, but there's also no need to really alarm right now. And it's also important not to do that uh, too fastly. The report of the Staatscommissie uh, Demografie, or the State Committee uh, Demographic Developments, uh, has published its report and as SAP we also delivered uh, data that we are co collecting right now or that we have collected and in the studies we did we looked at the impact of developments in the demographic uh, distribution in, uh, or composition in the Netherlands so with more elderly, with uh, different uh, composition in terms of cultural groups, so all aspects of demo demography. And what our data show is that uh, when you look, uh, when you model what will happen in the future, at the mean level, there's no uh, lowering in social cohesion. There are group differences that are related to social economic position and also to cultural groups, but on the whole also there we do not see any uh, evidence for uh, alarmistic thinking and also not for when we become a more multicultural society, which we are already moving towards, uh, that that does not have the dra dramatic uh, impact that some people think it may have. So some positive, but also some uh, reasons to worry. And one other reason to worry is that by talking all the time about polarization itself, we may actually fuel polarization and that's a dangerous development and uh, that is related to what uh, politicians sometimes do when they um, bring forward their ideological perspectives thereby also fueling polarization possibly media partisan media I mean, the Netherlands has, for example, a large amount of uh, choices in the media that are uh, public sources, like public television, for example, in the United States. And that makes quite a difference in that sense. We are positive, but still you see that polarized uh, images are displayed in the traditional media. And of course, also the so social media can produce uh, false perceptions of polarization. I'm trained as a psychologist, and in psychology uh, there's the, the construct of meta-perceptions, so the feeling that other people think in a certain way about you, and uh, in the area of intercultural relations uh, within a country, you see that that sometimes has a stronger negative effect on people than uh, the actual situation. So these uh, meta-perceptions can also, in the area of polarization, have uh, a very uh, negative impact. A lot of information about how we can look towards society and what is going well and what is going less well. And, well, at the negative side, disparities uh, and also low trust in government and, um, well, some polarization tendencies that we may want to stop are uh, bothering us and also ask for steps forward. And uh, one part of the solution may be in addressing inequalities. So really invest in resources and remedying inequalities and also looking closely, and I think there's a lot of research here going on on that as well, at intergenerational transfers of resources. And uh, what is very important, because when you look at the current cabinet or the past cabinet, uh, it's a matter of how you look at it, but they were really interested in taking measures to reduce poverty in the Netherlands. But what you see that is that at the same time, there are a lot of measures taken on other files, and those measures sometimes increase um, 
inequalities and are most negative to people who have the less. So it's very important to assess each policy's impact on inequality and poverty. What's not in this slide, but I think it's important, is also that we invest in people meeting each other. I grew up in the north of the Netherlands. I was on a, a school in, in Friesland. And uh, the children in the class were from all kinds of backgrounds. There was no uh, dispersion uh, in terms of uh, socio-economic position. Mm. I now live in Amsterdam. And that's quite a different story. And I also think some years have go by. It's really important to think about how we can make people meet each other because we are also having a study running right now, it's almost finished, and that study shows that the networks of people with the lowest income and the highest income become more and more a bubble, so people meet each other less uh, across uh, social economic uh, groups. And that's really problematic if you look at those different uh, viewpoints on societies and make, may in the end also fuel um, polarization. And then uh, what you see is that, and I'm really a fan of Michael Sandel, and he is pointing at the fact that the public debate is very much now focused on small issues on technocratic uh, conception of the public good, and there's a lack of ideological debate. And it's really important, I think, to uh, focus more on real big societal problems, uh, what we call, I think, in social sciences, wicked problems, and drive societal transformations, and not only focus on the technical aspects, but also the social aspects of those transformations to be more value-driven in approach uh, and not to run away from value-driven conversations. You see that even topics uh, related to education or to healthcare are uh, approached in a technocratic way, uh, whereas it's really necessary that we uh, think about what kind of future do, do we want and what kind of values do we deem important. And that is also part of civic debate so that people are uh, also discussing those issues amongst each other. And it's not simply a matter of politicians making, doing those discussions. And then um, to end, it's very important also part of political <coughs> leadership to come up with a clear story about what society is heading at. I see that it's very difficult <laughs> for um, people working for the government, but also for politicians, to really think about what kind of society would we like to be, and to, uh, to also explain to citizens uh, steps that, or decisions that are taken uh, related to that, that, that vision that should then also be value-driven uh, and long-term goals. And that makes it very difficult to make steps forward and also make clear to people which steps forward are actually accomplished. Uh, as SCP, we always say there are three things important for trust. Not to start a program how to develop trust, uh, because that can be a tendency of the government to do, but really to really show that you're making progress. Uh, so the first thing that is important is to deliver results and to show to citizens that you're actually able to accomplish things. And people in Groningen, but also on other files, are uh, anxiously waiting uh, until finally they are really helped. And it's very important to be focused uh, on uh, what you want to achieve and, and make steps forward to actually achieve that. The second thing uh, is related to justice. So to, to really uh, ensure procedural justice and to make sure that people feel treated just and to listen to people and to, to also actually see their needs. And the final one is related to participation uh, because the complex problems we have right, in, right now in society really ask for people to be part uh, of discussions about the right way to go. So when you know what your long-term goals are, 
it's uh, very important to actually involve people to take part in drawing uh, the plans for actually achieving those goals. And right now, well, we, we are asked a lot about uh, new forms of direct democracy, and those are important. But uh, we also think that in active policy making, it's much more important. It's important to, to really also involve uh, citizens in the making of plans because their input is actually needed for problems, for wicked problems for, their, for which there's no clear solution. And that was my presentation. Thank you. So on behalf of the audience, thank you very much for enlightening us with all this information and these insights. Uh, so there is no Q&A in the traditional sense. I'll do the cues. You do the idea. Let's just have a conversation on, on these topics. We can also turn it around. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Put me yeah. on the spot. Um, perhaps, I mean, you raised yeah. a lot of themes, a lot of issues. Yeah. I know that so much. Probably won't have time to deal with all of my questions that I have. Uh, but first, perhaps let's start with the role of the Netherlands Institute of Social Research. Mm -hmm. um, because you you mentioned that you're basically the, the, the connective tissue between social sciences on the one hand, more like the academic mm -hmm. social sciences, and policy on the other hand. Um, and I've seen some form of dilemma in the past with the Netherlands Institute of social, for Social Research in the sense that sometimes you deliver the, the, the dry information, the descriptive information, mm -hmm. you show that to policymakers, which is relevant yeah. to them, but then there's this complaint, well, offer policy advice, please, because you don't offer policy advice specifically. Mm -hmm. In other instances, um, on, on more of these hot topics like climate or migration, sometimes you see that, that there are some politicians, usually on the fringes, that then complain <laughs> about the role of the Netherlands Institute for yeah. Social Research. And then thirdly, in recent years, I, th I, sh I think that there is this tendency um, for, for the Institute to become more proactive, mm -hmm. to really on, on key moments in the political process offer reports, mm -hmm. not shy away from, from those moments, and in fact do offer some policy advice on very specific moments. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate those three <laughs> circumstances? Yeah, well, that's uh, the, uh, the dilemma between being relevant uh, and being independent scientific uh, is of course the dilemma that is there every day. Uh, and I think that uh, we have a history of writing quite long reports. Uh, and uh, we also know that right, uh, right now not many people read all these, those long uh, reports. So I think the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you are um, very close to where policy is made with bringing your data there. Uh, and I also think that... Um, uh, sometimes you are asked to, well, I'm asked to be a news viewer or, um, and then, uh, yeah, it's always uh, very uh, careful thinking about where can you make a link between what you put on the table and the data that, that you actually have. And if that link is not existing, then it's really important to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's a, a continuous uh, struggle or struggle. It's, uh, it's, I, I like to do that, but we have to be uh, const, uh, constantly um, aware of what is our role and what are we going to do and what will we not do. And on a daily basis, does it lead to uh, pushback from politicians sometimes? Um, well, I, I could there's, imagine that there, there's been a report a few years ago by the Nancy mm -hmm. Institute, a short report, I think it was before the elections, or otherwise it was before the mm -hmm. formation in 2021, where I almost literally saw a recommendation to reintroduce the referendum mm -hmm. um, as a way, as you just mentioned mm -hmm. in the end, for citizens to get involved, to participate. Mm -hmm. um, I could imagine that some politicians are not very much a fan of that recommendation. Does it lead to pushback? Um, well, I think um, um, I think this uh, specific no that that hasn't let. I think uh, when you have a pushback, but I mean there's a difference between having a pushback because people don't like what you say, and a pushback because people think you're not allowed to say something. I think that um, in this case it was not. Uh, 
at least if it was the uh, report that was there since I was the director, I think it was not forceful in the sense that we said, you have to do it. So we, we mentioned that as an option, and then uh, it's not um, encountered with aggression or negative feedback. Uh, we have been asked to um, um, think along with the new policy on childcare, uh, on parents getting free childcare for their kids. And uh, we have been quite critical about the, the policy that was put uh, to the table. And that has been, um, well, I've, I was in the on the board of the board of ministers. And at some point uh, I received uh, remarks that were not that positive, but that was not about the fact that we used and we did that together with the uh, central plan bureau. Uh, so the, that was not because it was not knowledge driven, but it was simply because uh, there was a coalition, coalition agreement. And what we were saying went against that. Uh, so the minister was really hopeless. What am I go going to do now? Because I promised to arrange it. And um, we said, it's really a bad idea. So, but that's a different example. I think the, the independence of the institute is, is crucial here. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's good that you can defend it like that. Now, regarding some of the sub substantive uh, um, yeah. elements that you showed in your presentation, I, I really liked how you showed that there is this connection almost between low trust in politics and mm -hmm. societal discontent. That those yeah. two themes, that they go very well together. Um, indeed, in, if you look at the, the literature on, on societal discontent, mm -hmm. um, that tends to have this core of, of a lack of control, that citizens experience yeah. a lack of control. Yeah. A lack of control of their, on their own lives, yeah. uh, lack of control of society on its own future, lack of control of politics on mm -hmm. society. Um, so I, I think lack of control is a crucial yeah. factor here. How can we address that? How do you have any recommendations how to, well, how to help citizens regain the control or who can help regain that control? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, a former colleague in psychology, Case van der Bos, wrote a nice book uh, in which he also speaks about his research. Is, is also a lot about uncertainty. Um, and I think that what he uh, expresses very loudly is that you have to provide uh, a lot of information and his book is very much about being uh, treating people in a just way. So I think those are two uh, things. Um, I also think I spoke a bit about identities. Um, so I think uh, it's also, uh, there are people in society that have, a pe have the feeling that they cannot belong to society. And I think it's very, we did a study on people that were skeptical about the measures uh, that we took during the Corona crisis or that the government took. Um, and these people told us that they really felt excluded by people in their environment, but also by the government and the way they were treated. So I think it's very important to do something about that. And the final point is what was on my first conclusion, step forward uh, sheet, is that if people lack the capital to um, find their way in society because they don't have access to a computer, or they need help and the, the system in, uh, in their neighborhood is so that they cannot find people who actually can help them with their problems. So I think that investing in social capital to make sure that people have the feeling I have control of my own life is, is very important. So I, I, I fully yeah. agree. And, and what I find um, interesting is, is, is the way that this connects to some of the p bigger patterns that, that also the political science literature finds here, for mm -hmm. instance, um, impartiality of, of, of governance, mm -hmm. of the executive, is very important for people to be able to trust politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to yep. do with control in the end. Because if you know that the procedures are fair, yep. that you will be treated fairly, that, that gives an element of control. You're, you're, you're not well, led to the whims of, yep. of some, some, some bureaucrat. Um, yeah. Similarly, another important element for people to be able to, to trust politics mm -hmm. is also to feel represented, to yeah. be represented. And I think that connects very well to one of your final slides, mm -hmm. the importance of value-based politics. Because value-based yeah, politics yeah. might give control. And uh, we were thinking about adding another slide on, 
on representation, but there has been uh, a publication, uh, it has been discussed in a newspaper by uh, Jaco Dagfos and also a colleague from the UFA here, in which they looked, for example, at the, the sense of representation uh, of people with a migrant background. Uh, and, uh, well, people with a migrant uh, background, and I think it's even more for the second generation, but regardless of whether they have a practical or a more theoretical level of education, um, feel uh, not represented by, uh, by the government. Uh, and the same holds, I think, for many people with a practical education in the Netherlands. So I agree that's a very important aspect. Well, one intriguing thing here, building mm -hmm. on that, is is um, you showed that the voters for VVD mm -hmm. and uh, Christian Democrats, etc., the Democrats, D66, they are much more trusting, whereas mm -hmm. the voters of particularly the, the Freedom Party and Forum, mm -hmm. are uh, they, they tend to lack trust. Um, these divisions, to some extent, have always been there, but in the past, we've always had new parties coming up mm -hmm. uh, that would mobilize the distrusting voters and bring them into the system. Yeah. So we've had the Democrats, D66, that started in 1967, confusingly. Um, <laughs> but, but in their first elections, they said, we're going to blow up the system. Yeah. And yeah. within a few years, they were part of the system, <laughs> and their voters were, became yeah. the most trusting in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, and now they really the re same. represent also, because uh, some people think that I'm a member of D66, and I'm not a member of any party. But when I was on television the first time, it was Buitenhof, um, the, I received uh, quite some very angry responses of people who thought, well, a blonde woman uh, actually uh, belonging to the elite. <laughs> Uh, and that evoked a lot of anger in people. So I was really shocked because, well, it was my first TV, as, at least uh, as, a, as the director of the SCP. I had been on television as a scientist, but that was different. But I was really amazed by the anger. And now it was not true, but uh, so the, this image of the D66 elite, uh, uh, yeah, um, it, in itself already evokes anger in, in some people. Exactly, and, and now the distrusting voters are nowadays mobilized by what we call the radical right, mm -hmm. particularly, but also by the radical left to some extent. But other, unlike in the past, they are not brought in. These voters are yeah. not brought into the system, but they remain at the fringes. They remain yeah. distrusting. What do you think is the main explanation for that? Is that the socioeconomic part that you showed? Is is that the value-based part? What what's, what might be going on here? I think that uh, perhaps in the past the uh, um, well the bringing into the system was uh, more related, uh, more appealed to people's identity and to a group people wanted to be part of, and now you see these groups also in, uh, evolving online. So also in the people uh, in the study on the people that are skeptical. Uh, about the corona measures. They said that they went online and they felt really happy that they met other people who were just like them. Uh, and I think those places where people find each other kind of replace what used to be, well, that you became a member of, of a political party or, um, uh, so I, th but I'm not sure. I mean, we haven't researched that, but. Uh, Is the fact that these people are distrusting a problem. Is distrust by itself a problem? Is it a problem that trust has declined <laughs> over the last few years in the Netherlands? Well, I think to a certain extent, I think that people are, the fact that people are distrusting is, is not a bad thing because, well, I also said in my presentation with the same with um, uh, societal unease. Uh, it's good that people are critical and, um, um, well, I come from a left-wing family, and in our house there was a lot of distrust towards everyone who, uh, who was uh, right-wing or uh, not the government in general. But I think that fueled uh, intellectual discussions, and, and so I think in a democratic society that's a good thing. But if people really uh, kind of uh, move away from the system and, and turn their back to it, 
uh, that can be at a certain point problematic. And if the people who now say, well, perhaps we want to, to use violence, really feel so much in despair that they are going to do that, that would be problematic. I don't think we are there yet, uh, but it can be problematic in a cert at a certain point. Um, and what I think is problematic is not... Um, the fact that people are critical is good, but we need support of people for the big transitions that we have to make. So if people... Uh, don't even seriously consider anymore what the plans are and the solutions, but think, well, this is not my piece of cake. Uh, that can be pro problematic for society. Yeah. And you, well, you see that in, in sustainability uh, right now, well, things are slowed down because of uh, anti-voices. Um, and that's not generally linked to that people are against the government. But in a way, there are some lines connected to that. And I think that's really worrisome. And, and those lines, again, they're also politicized by yeah. themselves in the yeah. ways that we, we just discussed. Yeah. And I know from early publications by the Netherlands Institute that, that, that there's also this, what you also showed here before, is there's this, this stapling of inequalities. Mm -hmm. There is a group mm -hmm. that is struggling not just economically, but also socially and mm -hmm. politically. Yeah. Um, that's a combination where, where these things come together. Um, that might be a group that, that you might be more concerned about, about their voice, about their involvement, um, and their, their ability and willingness to keep on participating yeah. within this democracy. Yeah, the first concern is, of course, that those people have a right to have a decent living, uh, because that's also part of human rights and, and, and a decent society. But the second thing is that you don't want people to, well, to uh, to push away themselves away from the government and to perhaps also be pushed. But also in between people, you don't want to have too strong divides between people who have everything and people who ha do, who don't have. And do you think that that from from your experience yeah. that this is a topic that government is sufficiently aware of or involved in? I mean, I, I, at the very least, they are aware in the sense that we see that they pay lip service to this problem, but at the same time, it seems to be an insurmountable issue in terms of actual policies being realized. I think that um, on a certain level, there's real realization that this is the case, although I doubt, uh, I remember that um, um, Need la not last Christmas, but the Christmas before, before Christmas, I, we were say, I said something in the on the board about inequality. And then the response was, there is no increasing inequality. And then we published the report with the different, showing the different groups. And then suddenly it was taken a little bit more seriously. Uh, but I think the basic idea uh, that we are living in a, a country that is uh, very uh, wealthy um, is more dominant than the realization that there are also people who do not uh, have that level of wealth. Um, and in that sense, the, the, the phrasing of elite to point at people in politics is, um, well, quite at its place because I think the people who are sitting there really do not realize what is going on in society. And that is problematic. Uh, and if they do, they try to take measures, but also they have to do fundamental changes. And those fundamental changes um, ask uh, for questioning uh, the system. <laughs> Uh, and I think that is something they don't want to do because they're also concerned about the political reality they're part of. And the, the, the functioning of the government uh, that is like a big elephant that is not easy to change. So I think uh, there are too many steps to take uh, and it's too risky to go on that path. And the theme mm -hmm. has been discussed in, in, in election debates over in the last few years. Mm -hmm. In policies, you don't see too much of a change. Mm -hmm. Is this related to the, this political culture that we've been talking about for years now mm -hmm. that needs to change? Uh, Bestaanszekerheid was a main theme in the last elections. Mm -hmm. Do you see likely change? Or do you think that, that these structures that you just mentioned are too fierce um, to enable those changes? Well, I mean, uh, I don't know what is going to happen in the formation. <laughs> and there are a couple of parties who have promised things to society. Uh, but I think that uh, big 
the big steps are needed uh, and the political parties are, are not very clear about the offers they are willing to make in order to achieve a better distribution of wealth. And, and so I'm not yet so optimistic to think that it's immediately changing. Yeah. Hmm. Perhaps um, let, let, let's go back one step uh, to, to public opinion yeah. again. Um, what I found very intriguing, what you mentioned both for political trust mm -hmm. Um, and what you also showed for polarization is that there is this pessimistic idea. There is this idea that we have a deep crisis of trust and that polarization is going up. Mm -hmm. And well, particularly when it comes to trust, um, I do quite a bit of trust research myself. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go abroad, I'm, I, I keep on saying, well, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we have a political trust crisis. Trust is going down. And they ask me, how high is it? I said, well, it depends on how you measure it, but 30 to 40 percent. And then I'm the laughing stock of the conference because <laughs> 30 to 40 percent in most countries would be very high. I mean, not in China, not in Qatar, because there it's 80 percent or higher. But uh, in France, in, in, in um, I don't know, in the UK, in the US, in Spain, in Italy, they would be happy with those, those figures. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, for us it's very low, but comparatively speaking, it's still not even that bad. And um, there is a decline in trust, but it's very specific. It's, it's aimed at politics in The Hague. Mm -hmm. uh, the timing makes sense mm -hmm. because it was, it was in response to failing politics, I would say. Um, the causes are quite clear, as you showed. Mm -hmm. Causes that, intriguingly, align incredibly well with what, what the political mm -hmm. trust literature okay. says. These are the most important okay. drives of political trust. Um, and still we think that there's a huge, big, deep crisis. And we also thought that when trust was at peak levels, for instance, in 2019, mm -hmm. or, or earlier than that. And the same pessimistic streak is something that we find for polarization, mm -hmm. as you showed, uh, that we find when it comes to the economy. We always think that the economy is going down the drain, at least public opinion thinks so. Um, that crime, uh, crime rates mm -hmm. are going down. In fact, um, the crime rates overall, except for some crimes, are not necessarily going down. People's, mm -hmm. the, the thermometers, yeah on crime yep. seem to be doing mm -hmm. quite well in, in, yep. in a positive societal, societal positive way. But our ideas on how we are feeling are going down. So there is this pessimistic streak. Mm -hmm. Why? Do, do we have any insights where that's coming from? Um, because that seems to be a big driver of these debates. And you warned us mm -hmm. that these narratives might lead to an outcome where we start believing our own false ideas. Yeah, well, I think that um, all the directors of the, the SAP have been uh, saying, well, uh, I'm fine, but uh, the society is not fine. Uh, so I think that is a, a general, general tendency of people to perhaps look more negative towards their uh, environment, although I have done uh, cancer research for a while and then the quality of life of cancer patients. Uh, they are much more positive about their own situation compared to others. But um, I think that uh, this negative tier may be of all, all times, but I think that if you look at the concrete examples that people mention, well, perhaps you should say not the pessimism is the biggest problem, but the fact that, the, that politics is not capable of solving the problems. And I think that that feeling is uh, not necessarily of all ages the same. So I, and I also think that right now, well, uh, we have huge issues with, uh, with the environment that have been postponed for quite a while. And also the affairs that I pointed at are uh, quite serious and also affairs are, of course, of all ages. But I think the kind of problems that come together uh, are, and we see that 70% of people think that uh, their children and grandchildren will have be in a worse, in a more negative position than themselves. I'm not sure if that is of all time. So I think there is a, a more negative uh, atmosphere right now than there used to be. And that goes, of course, with um, but it's a psychological fact that people tend to be a little bit pessimistic uh, of their future and that that, sh that future feels insecure. 
but I think we have had politicians that were fighting with each other, but that were more clear about the kind of future they were heading towards. And I think right now we lack that sense of what the future will look like in a period of time where we have to make those transformations. And I think that um, that brings some extra to the pessimism. One of the most concerning things that you showed was the, the anti-democratic tendencies mm -hmm. among a, a, a part of the population. That support for democracy in specific situations is not always a given. Um, and again, we, we see that to some extent in other studies as well. Mm -hmm. Just a few years ago, there was this uh, study that showed that um, based on these concerns that you just mentioned, the idea mm -hmm. that the future is going, going to be bad, people are willing to temporarily set aside democracy to solve these, mm -hmm. these major problems, be it climate for left-wing or progressive citizens, yeah. or migration for right-wing citizens, yeah. people are willing to do that yeah. under circumstances and then hope to come back to democracy as soon as these issues are solved. Um, citizens are willing uh, not to punish their own yeah. politicians if they deal with the issues they, that they think yeah. are relevant. And you, you showed this on a more fundamental yeah, level. Yeah, we also published um, uh, a report on the request on a, uh, of another state committee, and that was uh, about uh, law and de democracy, in which we also showed that, for example, the, in democracy there is an important protection of the rights of minorities, and that also people say, well, the, uh, in some cases the majority can get what, even when it goes at the expense of mi minorities. So there are more in inclina uh, we. Uh, in more in different ways, our data show that well, people have that feeling. <laughs> Democracy is sometimes less important than that, than that we get what we want for our good life. Yeah. Then, but then the final question that I yeah. have is, how do we keep those people committed to democracy? What's the next step? What 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 should we do? Either we as scholars, or what should citizens or media do, or politicians do? Who do you think is the first in line to ensure that, that this, this latent potency of anti-democratic sentiments or attitudes mm -hmm. does not manifest itself? Um, well, I think that um, everyone has a role to play here, but I think that the things I have been saying about that politics needs to do the things that were on my slides, uh, I think that is a first step in the right direction because you were talking about a lack of control. If you don't have the feeling that uh, the government is, is standing up for your needs, and sometimes not, but then you understand why it's in common interest that they go in a certain direction and that you also have a feeling they know where they are heading, uh, I think these sentiments uh, uh, get less room. Uh, so I think that would be most important. Thank you very much. Thank you.